Hey everyone, it's Jim from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 47, we're going to take a look at the RFT EL34, reviewed in the Wilsonton R8 amp. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Last week, a nice order of NOS, new old stock, NIB, new in the box, RFTs came in. And to find this many high testing, brand new, vintage EO34s is a day truly for celebration. Brand new vintage power tubes are getting rarer and rarer. So I thought, let's do a dedicated tube review just for this one tube. Now, they're all rebranded AEG. In fact, they have these lovely boxes that are in really in good shape. And I'm pretty sure they're original because have a look inside. They've got a really unique cradle that I've never seen. You see that? That's... Re the tube just nests. Let me grab one. It just nests inside there. See that? It just It's like it's in a cradle. It's just perfect. So I think we've got real boxes. Now reproduction boxes are a thing and there's nothing wrong with them so long as you know the seller says that they're reproduction boxes. In fact virtually any popular tube is, has had a reproduction box made and I actually have never had an AEG tube in. Now, that's a rebrand. AEG just translates to General Electric Germany. So they rebranded the tubes for resale. And that's something RFT did a lot. One of the very common rebrands was no less than Siemens. When I was researching this tube, I found some people claiming the RFT was basically a Siemens tube made in East Germany. Now, RFT is short for ready, are you ready? Rundfunk und Fernmeld Technik. Now my <laughs> my apologies to all German speakers out there. I hope I got it close. That translates to radio, TV, and telecommunication. Now that makes more sense, doesn't it? And RFT was a consortium of state-owned companies, all based in the former DDR or German Democratic Republic. Or simply, we just say, the former East Germany, yeah? Does the fact that they were made in a socialist state mean that they aren't good tubes? No, absolutely not. Remember, Siemens thought they were good enough to rebrand as their own. And that says a lot. Okay, enough history and blah, blah, blah. How did they sound? Well, really good. But actually, before we do the review, let's take a close look at the tube. Now, they, they had a really very standard um, set of details that really didn't change over the production years, as far as I can tell. I've had quite a few RFTs in over the years, and, um, and they don't stay in long. They're, they're a fairly high demand tube, and until now, I've never really had more than one or two quads in the store at any one point in time. So, they're characterized by four large rivets on each side, two fairly small slits on each side of the plate. They're a, um, a single supported, fairly large halo getter with a big chrome dome. Now, if you want to know if you've got a real RFT and not some kind of a fake, have a look at the base. Uh, now, we always look at the base with a new tube anyways. That tells a story, right? If the base is pristine, that's almost certainly a really a brand new tube. But have a look. Where's my pointer? Hang on a second. Have a look here. Let me see if I can get it in. There we go. You see right where the, um, the pins come out of the plastic base? There's a little circle. Sort of like a little protrusion or a reinforcement. There it is. That's the real McCoy. And that's a, that's a dead giveaway. You've got a real RFT. There's so many of these rebranded that you you really have to look for identifiers because, you know, 
that somebody could be passing off a Chinese tube and you wouldn't know it unless you, you knew the key aspects of uh, a true RFT. So let's look at some of the rebrands. Here's a Sylvania. Look at the base. You see the, the little indents or the bumps at each pin. There we go. It's on camera. And here's an S service. So that was that stands for Siemens service, yes? And the same thing. You can see the little bumps. In fact, this is probably the most one of the most common rebrands. I'm not certain, but I have a feeling that Siemens probably set up the RFT plant to make what is basically a Siemens EO34. There were glimmerings of information online about this, but nobody really had the definitive uh, lowdown on it. And a big part of that is that the uh, all of this history predates um, the internet. And um, and a lot of the research that's been done has all been in, done in German. So maybe a German speaker out there can do some research and, um, and put some stuff up in the comments. That would be helpful. Okay, so how did they sound? Well, let's get out the listening sheet. So bass was good plus. Very good tone. Very clean. Not muddy. Maybe neutral plus. Mid-range is very good. Very clean and clear. Excellent detail. Less distortion than the Svetlana EO34. Um, and maybe slightly less warm. And there's some trade-offs. And we'll talk about those in a minute. We'll come back. Trouble was the three C's, as I like to call them. Clean, clear, and crisp. And it was very good. Um, noise and microphonics were very low, which makes sense. I mean, this is a quality uh, EL34, and it's brand new, so it bloody well better be very low, right? In fact, the EL34 in general is, a, is a, quite a, a quiet power tube. In conclusion, I wrote detail, detail, detail. And that, of course, equals stereo separation, and that equals a lovely sound stage. So how do we get there? Anytime you've got this level of clarity, particularly in the mid-range, 90% of all your music sits in the mid-range. 90%, give or take. Depends, you know. Um, depends on what you're listening to. I mean, if you're listening to a, um, a solo bass track, obviously that's not true. But in general, most of your music is sitting in the mid-range. That's why mid-range response is so absolutely critical. And that's probably why... Um, tubes like the, the Muller DL34XF2, which is a very warm sounding tube and has a fabulous mid-range, why they're so loved. So what are the trade-offs? Well, you give up a little bit of distortion and a tiny bit of warmth, and in return you get a lot of clarity and detail. And that that can make for a really a, a really lovely presentation. It's um, if, if you're going to be listening to, um, small ensemble acoustic, which is my style of jazz, you're going to be able to hear, um, things like the, the little flutter of, of a sax reed or, um, the sort of a, a heavy pluck on a bass string. Those things come through when you're, when you have that much clarity. And they're t for audiophiles, that's nirvana. <laughs> we live for that kind of shit. <laughs> Good shit. <laughs> Pardon my language. Um, and, um, and we just take joy in it. Now, one of the reasons why uh, I spend so much time reviewing tubes is because if you change out a set of tubes, you basically have a different amplifier. And it's handy to know what your power tubes, what your driver tubes, what your preamp tubes, what they sound like. So that if you're into, if you love that level of clarity and you'd like to have a little less distortion, a little slightly less warmth in the mid-range, you're going to love a power tube like this. If you like your crooners uh, sing throaty, um, throaty vocals and uh, you want the maximum warmth, you're going to want maximum distortion. And something like the um, the lovely Svetlana EL34, the vintage tube, of course, they uh, they excel at that. Uh, and um, and a, 
and an absolutely fabulous tube, the, the Muller DL34XF2 series, it has an absolutely gorgeous mid-range. And a lot of the, the beauty of the mid-range is that extra harmonics that you're getting out of the tube. The tube is adding stuff to the music. In fact, tubes in general sound so good because they add a little tiny bit, a little bit of je ne sais quoi, a little bit of this and that. Some tubes add a bit more, some a bit less. This this one adds a little bit less. Um, the Svetlana adds quite a bit more. But the more distortion you have, the less clarity, right? And the less detail, of course. So it's not surprising. I've got customers that have two, three, four sets of power tubes, and they'll rotate them on a regular basis because they'll be listening to some wonderful acoustic jazz on a very high re resolution recording. And they'll put in something like the RFTs and they'll love them to death. And then maybe they're having a dinner party and they've got, um, you know, a, a wonderful jazz vocalist like Anita, Anita, Anita <laughs> I'm tongue tied, Anita O'Day, um, who's just a wonderful vocalist. And they'll put in a, their quarter mullards for that because the, the, they'll really bring out Anita. And frankly, those recordings, they're so old now that the level of detail, eh, it's not going to be quite there, I don't think. Not like a more modern um, audiophile recording, certainly. So um, so why is that? Well, wh why changing tubes makes such a difference? Well, the tubes sound a bit different, but you've got to remember the tubes are the amplifier. That's right. All tubes, the main job is to amplify. Some tubes are primarily voltage amplifiers like the preamp tubes, and some tubes are more current amplifiers like power tubes. And they, they're basically pushing out the sound through the output transformer. Okay, let's put this stuff away and have a look at some really lovely vintage tubes that came in. Let's get them all up. It's more fun that way. <laughs> That's a quad of Mullers. Here's a pair of lovely Melt 6SL7s. Let's get some little roadblocks <laughs> up so that nothing rolls off. I've been dropping things all morning and that's a that's a sure sign I'm a little tired. So stay with me, folks. Let's start with this lovely thing. A uh, little pile of these came in, enough for a matched pair and a couple of singles. Let's look at the box. This is just fabulous. U.S. Army, U.S. Navy. It's a Jan, Joint Army Navy, 6SL7 GT or VT229. What is that? Well, 229 is just the U.S. military designation for the 6SL7. <laughs> they had designations for all, all, all tubes that they used. So the contractor was General Electric. General Electric was huge. In fact, General Electric was so big, they started RCA. Yep, they started RCA. Um, and presumably were a majority owner of it. Um, but these were manufactured by Slovenia Electric Products, Inc. And they were accepted on 943. So that means that the, um, that the U.S. government received these tubes uh, on September 1943. So these are real uh, vintage World War II tubes. And look at the shape of the boxes. They're just pristine. There's a little bit of print through from boxes that were adjacent to it. Maybe even when the print was wet. Or maybe they got slightly wet at some point. But the boxes look perfect. There's no water damage or anything. Let's uh, open one up. These are tricky boxes to get into. It takes a little bit of pushing and pulling. I'm pushing, I'm pulling. We've seen these before. I love these cradles. Look at that. Isn't that amazing? You see how that nests? And you can actually see that your tube's in the box, right? Without opening it up. That's for a visual inspection. And that's very much, you know, an army spec kind of thing, because you want to make sure you actually have a tube in your box. Let's look at these nice and close. Look at the size of the waste chrome, which means, of course, that there's a bottom getter, but it's such, look at, it's just pristine. If you want to know if a vintage tube that's really quite old, or any tube for that matter, look at the chrome. If it's nice and heavy, 
or supposed to be most nice and heavy. Some tubes actually uh, will have normally a small amount and you need to know which one has which. But the early Sylvanias from the 1940s and 50s, they had large amounts of waste chrome. And as they age in service or in storage, if they're losing the vacuum, this will dis dis slowly uh, disappear. And you'll see a white ridge as it goes away. So the more the better. And this is perfect. That's that's just brand new. And you can't see it, but way down here there is there is a, a bottom getter. And it's a foil getter, right? Which is just a little piece of um, of metal that carried that carried our gettering, which is probably boron. Um, but there are a couple of metals that were used. So let's look at the base here. Jan, of course, we talked about that. It's really well labeled. Let's look at the bottom. The pins tell a story, and the pins are absolutely pristine, brand new. And is typical for pretty much all of the Sylvania 6SL7s. It has a rounded, single-winged plate, and a pair of them, of course, because this is a twin triode, right? This is a high-gain tube, around 70, or a mu of 70, same thing. And they're black coated. The mil spec tubes were almost, not all of them, but mo almost all of them were black coated. Some of them were gray coated. This is a tube I specialize in. It's in my top three, maybe top four 6SL7s. They are fabulous sounding tubes. And there's a lot of warmth from these early 1940s and 50s tubes. But interestingly enough, I've been getting really into the newer versions um, from the 1970s, and they sound great as well. So, Sylvania made fabulous sounding 6SN7s and 6SL7s, hands down. I've never actually heard a bad one. Some are a little better than others, depending on what, you know, model and year. Okay, let's move those aside. Let's keep this moving. <laughs> All right, we're going to have another long video. Everyone knows that I love the metal base melts tubes. They're very similar to the Sylvania that we just looked at. Different sound, slightly. They're definitely their own tube. And... Um, and a nice, a nice, uh, fairly close matched, uh, new old stock pair came in and they're in the store. Unfortunately, um, from the moment I started talking about how great the metal base 6SL7 melts were, the price keeps going up. Um, and, um, nothing I can do about it. Wholesalers just keep on raising the price. And they are a tube that are prone to be noisy. They're a tube that are prone to go um, to go bad. Interestingly enough, if I get them on the tester and I get them through the listening test, they're fine. So the because they're such an expensive tube, even wholesale, I think what's happening is people are just scrounging whatever they got lying around and selling them, thinking that, oh, I can make a quick buck. Well, after they go on the tester, you know, the tester will tell the truth electrically and my ears will tell the truth as to whether they're noisy. So the loss rate is high. And sometimes the sellers compensate me and sometimes they're stubborn <laughs> and they refuse to, you know, they refuse to compensate for a noisy or bad testing too. And that's, you know, it's a loss. And that just factors into the price, unfortunately. So what have we got left? We've got a, a wonderful quad quite high testing quad of Mullard XF2s. Single getters, let's take a quick look at them. You know, I can talk about Mullard EL34s all day long. It's, it's without a doubt, my absolute favorite EL34s. They're so expensive that I do not play them every day of the week. In fact, I only listen to them when I test them for customers. I usually make a quad and they sell, you know, within a week. Um, and then I'm working on another quad. Right now I have three sets of three matched, close matched, single getters, and I have three sets of three uh, close matched double getters. <laughs> Imagine the investment. These are expensive tubes to buy even wholesale. And um, they're con I'm constantly bringing them in, but it takes so many tubes to get a close matched quad. Anyways, um, let's take a quick look. So if you want to know if you've got a real Muller and what series of EL34 you've got, let's see if we can get the code on. Can you see that? I'll read it for you. It's, it's etched in the, in the shoulder at the bottom. XF2, so that's the series, series number two. 
And then the next line is B, 0, C, 4. Now the B stands for the Blackburn plant in the UK, which was a huge plant. And, um, and the 0 stands for the year. So that could be 1960 or 1970. And these are such nice looking tubes. I suspect that it might be 1970. And the C is the month and the four is the week. So I believe, I don't have my code book in front of me here, but C is the third letter. So it's probably March, uh, fourth week of March. Don't quote me on that though. <laughs> uh, I rarely actually identify twos specifically by the date that they were made. I'm mainly concerned they're so rare that finding XF2 solidly on the tube or identifying the parameters, that's, that's all I go by. I can't, ma I can't match a quad by, um, by year and month or even by year. It's just not possible. I'd have to have hundreds of tubes in to manage that. And there just aren't that many out there. Okay, so those just went in the store. And if you stay till the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Uh, I've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Okay, stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing out. Cheers, everyone.